pours into emotions. And so when we sing, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, that's so much powerful than just speaking, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. And then collectively when we come together, we're able to unify in that and just, just proclaim that, that Jesus is a hope that we can turn towards. So why don't you join us as we sing some more songs.
it's, uh, it's a way to say thanks for being here today, but also to connect with us. Please, it's really important that you write clearly too, because the first time I, I uh, think filled it out, my address ended up being 1280 Civic Peak Drive, and it's Riviera Point Street, so I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> make sure you fill this out clearly. I know it's hard sometimes when you laugh, but we want to make sure we keep connecting with you, and that's, this is the way we do it. Uh, please hang on to it until after service. Um, in the info center, you'll be able to get this. So just a second, our welcome team is going to pass by with uh, the community buckets. I think they may have already, and, and get that uh, the information from you and any offers that you may have today. So thanks again. Welcome for being here. After service today, we will have a prayer at that corner over there. If you feel like you need prayer, you can um, write it here in our card as well, but also come over over here. Bernie's <laughs> showing us the... Or Bernie, that not white, is <laughs> showing us the where we will all be um, praying together. So please feel free to join us if you feel you need um, some cheerful delight today and some hope. Thank you so much. Bienvenidos a Mujer de Church 20. Here's the Amy Church. Mujer de Church 20 is a special night in which our pastor Tony and his beautiful wife Kelsey host a delicious dinner for new members. At this event, you will have an opportunity to learn about Church 20 and the heart direction and the church. Tony and Kelsey will be sharing their story and facilitating a conversation about the future. The next Future Church 180 is tonight at 7 p.m. Be sure to check Future Church 180 in your connections card if you wish to attend. Thank you so much for your participation in the Blanket Project for the San Diego School District. Together, we are able to make a huge impact. Check us out. Well, I'm just like, 
wheeling around on a scooter, like kind of giving orders. And, and I guess my point is this, okay? The thing I'm trying to say is this, is that um, we're, we're, we're week three. This is week three of this church. And, and, and this is a good, healthy reminder for me, and this is a good, healthy reminder for all of us. This church isn't about me. It's never going to be about me. It's about Jesus, and it's about his community of coming together to bring him glory, to worship him, and to point towards him. And that's what it will always be about. It's just a great reminder. And I felt like I needed to just get that off my chest from the get-go this morning um, as we uh, continue on in week three of this series. I want to point out a couple more things to you before we, we, we launch in, um, because I don't think we had communicated with Raquel where the info table would be um, <laughs> for after the service, if this is your first time, um, or you, you want to turn in a connection card and, and everything like that. It's in this back left corner today. It's usually very clear in an info center out there, but rainy day today, so we're like, okay, let's make you let's figure this thing out. And, uh, and so it'll be back there. The other thing I want to mention to you is that 10 minutes after the service today, stick around. Don't just go right home. Stick around 10 minutes after the service today. You saw the video of the baptism. We're going to have another baptism today. As soon as we get to life of Jesus. And uh, it's about to So um, that's really exciting. Okay, I want to say two things before I pray and we get going. Okay? We're in this series called Turn Towards. Okay? Turn Towards dot, dot, dot. And what we've said from the get-go, and what I will say every week until we move on to a new series, is this. Is that this series is built on two ideas, okay? And the first one is this, is that we are all one turn away from home. I believe that every single one of us is, is one turn away from home. Whether that's a wholesale, I was going this direction, and Jesus is over here, and I'm completely turning, and, 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 and turning towards him with my life, and giving my life to him. Or, or whether that be certain aspects and areas of our lives that we're running from Him, we need to take that area and turn back towards Him for help. And we said that, that's the, the first thing. The second thing is this. Uh, the second thing is that turning towards anything, and I'm having a hard time on um, and I will do that. Um, turning towards anything means turning away from something. Literally, you can't turn towards two opposing things at the same time. I mean, it's just common sense. And so we just want to recognize that up front and say that as we keep plowing through this series, um, we've said the first week, turn towards someone greater. Turn towards Jesus rather than someone less. In the second week, we said turn towards becoming over and rather than turning towards escaping. And, and today we're going to talk about this idea of turning towards a calm. Uh, but before we jump in, uh, I want to I pray for us to get going. So Jesus, uh, we thank you, thank you, thank you that we have the opportunity to freely worship you in this room this morning. And I pray that we don't take that for granted, God. Uh, I pray that over these next few moments, that God, that, that you just remove me out of the way, that you speak, Lord. That you open your word to us, and that you, uh, God, impress on our hearts and impress on our minds what you want to be communicated. Um, so, uh, God, we just put all of our hope and all of our trust in you in this moment. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so, I got to say this. <laughs> so, today, we're kind of, we're working through the book of Mark, if you've been with us. And uh, we're working through the first chapter still, and we're actually only on verse 14, and it's our third week. <laughs> that's, that's all the further we've made, and it's cool. But today... In verse 14, where we're going to open up, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 in a minute, it is, it is like, it, 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 there's a point, there's like a line in the sand, because today what we're talking about is game day, okay? It's game day. I don't know if you've ever had a game day before, but as soon as I like started reading just some of the commentaries on this text, and studying what some scholars said, as soon as I started looking at it, uh, it, it immediately brought back memories of high school to me. And there's one specific game day. That I remember it was in 2002, and it was our homecoming game for football against Pawnee, the Pawnee Indians. And, uh, and I remember that day, uh, so many different elements of it. I remember I had this buddy, his name is Matt, and I called him Huckleberry Finn because he was always into out, outdoor stuff, so he was my buddy Huck. And, and Huck, that day, had secured um, a, a Jeep Wrangler from his uncle. And he wasn't 16 yet, but, but, but I was, and he was like, okay, my uncle said you can drive uh, the Jeep for the day. And so we took the top off, and I remember that morning putting on my, my game day jersey, because you wore your game day jersey to school, and then I don't know why, this is the 
stupidest thing in the world. I, I get it. But I wore a pair of overalls with one of them undone um, <laughs> over, over my jersey and, um, and, and, and drove this Jeep around all day long. And um, I, I, I'm not recommending this. I think I skipped classes that day. Um, we were just so amped because it was, it was homecoming night. It was game day. And we weren't very good, but we won that game. <laughs> And, and I remember everything down to the first theory um, that I had that night. And it was just memorable because it was go time. It was game day. And what we're looking at in the text this morning, as we get into verse 14, what I want you to see is that it's game day. It's, this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Uh, last week we covered, the, or two weeks ago, we covered the fact that this man named John the Baptist went before Jesus and he prepared the hearts and the minds uh, of the people for the message of Jesus. He was what was called a forerunner. He was preparing and paving the way. Last week we talked about Jesus' becoming time as he, as he was baptized by John, he was affirmed by the Father, and he went into the wilderness for 40 days to become who he needed to become for the ministry of the right hand. And today is the inauguration. Today is the beginning of his ministry. We're going to be in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 is where it starts, and it says this. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. After John was put in prison. So, so what we see is once John is, is, is in prison, for speaking this bold message, for talking about Jesus, for causing an uprising in the, in the, in the Roman um, Empire at the time. John was in, in prison. And, and it, after John, like, okay, so, so while John is proclaiming his message, while John is preaching the kingdom of God, while John is paving the way for Jesus, Jesus just by his time. Because John's creating this ball of momentum. And John is preparing people. And this, this wave is being prepared for the message of Jesus. But now, John's in prison. And because John's in prison, it's like, okay, we've got all this momentum, and it's time for Jesus to strike. And so we see in verse 15, it says this, um, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. I love that it just says, that Jesus just says right there in verse 15, he says, the time has come. He recognizes John was put in prison, and he says, the time has come. Because the time, like what I think a lot of us know in here is the timing is very critical, isn't it, about a lot of things. Immediately I was thinking about this text and, and, and what Jesus said here. And I was thinking about the, 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 the beginning of this church. Because the, the thing about, I don't, I don't know if you, what we call it is the launching a church plant. I don't know if that language falls anywhere with you. But the reality is that this, what we're doing right now, is a long time in the process coming. It's not like we just like, oh, one day, like on the... 26th of January, we're like, okay, it's the grand opening, and everything just happens. Like, it's a long time coming. And so the organization that we work with that's kind of helped us put the pieces in place for the beginning and the establishment of this church, uh, they help you time it out. And they, and they say, hey, here's some steps to take. And there's a lot of work over the last year, um, specifically the last nine months. And I remember we were just getting rolling, and we were like, okay, I think we can be ready by February. Maybe we'll launch on February. 23rd, we'll have our big grand opening on February 23rd, and, and I was like, oh, be memorable because that's my 35th birthday. No, 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 no. And so, and so we, um, and so we, we, we kind of just said February 23rd, that's going to be our day. We're going to, we're going to, we can get everything done, all the necessary steps, and, and you know, get ready. And on February 23rd is going to be the day. And then I remember, like it was yesterday, and I shared this a couple weeks ago, uh, or three, four weeks, I don't know. But I shared this a few weeks ago. But I remember I was working on some of the steps that we were, you know, preparing for this church. And, and Kelsey came storming into our bedroom, and I could tell that she wasn't happy, and she slapped the pregnancy test right on the desk in front of me to reveal that she was pregnant, and we were like, oh no. <laughs> Timing is critical. <laughs> it's critical. And so now we had to go back to the drawing board with, you know, a, a group of uh, leadership in this church, and go, well, what are we going to do? Because timing matters. The moment to strike matters. The moment to, 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 to let everything begin, in fact, and I hope we made a good decision with January 26th. Um, I think we did. But the, the point that I'm trying to, to make is this, is that timing matters, and the time has come. And what we see out of Jesus right there in verse 14, or in verse 15, it says, the time has come, he said, 
The kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And so we covered this, I think, two weeks ago, where we talked about this idea of good news. Uh, and it's literally, a, it could be swapped out and, and, and used for the word that we say as gospel, which gospel just sounds like some kind of big churchy word. It's not really a big word, but it just sounds like a really churchy word. And you're like, I don't know what gospel means. Well, gospel just means good news. And, 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 and literally, this wasn't a religious term that, that Jesus would use. He said, repent and believe the good news. And, and all that meant was a political term that meant history or life-shaping news. That, that believe this history-making, believe this life-shaping, believe this incredible will alter, not leave you the same, change you good news. And he says, repent and believe this good news. And so what we start to see and what I want to kind of unpack, and you kind of have this in your note sheet this morning, if you've got a pen and you want to start to follow along, is that in the text we're looking at, John starts to point out a few things that I believe are worth us knowing and worth us looking into and checking out. The first thing is this, and we see right there in verse 15, is that the kingdom of God is arriving. The kingdom of God is arriving. Now, that sounds really churchy, and if you're new to this whole thing, you'd be like, I don't even know what that means, okay? Here's what that means. Here's, here's what I mean by that. Okay? The kingdom of God, if, if you're unsure of what the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of God is this. The kingdom of God is anywhere that Jesus has his reign and rule in the world right now. Anywhere. It could be your life. It could be an area of your life. It could be this room right now. It could be anywhere that Jesus has his reign and rule is the kingdom of God. And what Jesus says is, repentantly, the kingdom of the kingdom of God is, is arriving. It's coming near. And, and, and the other thing I want to point out about the kingdom of God is it's, it's, it's a now and not yet that kingdom. I was thinking of the thing, it's like a now and later, that kingdom. Anybody had a now and later in here? Anybody, anybody know what a now and later is? There really, there's only like four people who know what a now and later is. Okay, yeah, they're not good. I don't think this is it's not a good thing. Sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> There. But I think we, I, if you had a now and later, um, I, I kind of Googled it this week. I was like, why is it called a now and later? It's, it takes so long to get to the end of it. Like, it's like now and later you're done with it. Um, and that's actually not the point of now and later. Right? I Googled it this week, and, and it turns out it was, I guess, one of the first candies like Starburst or something like that where you could buy a pack and you'd have some now. And then you roll your pack up. And you have some later. <laughs> and, and, and the reality is, is that the kingdom of God is a now and later kingdom. And here's what I mean by that. The kingdom of God is arriving. Jesus was ushering it in with his message. And there are places all over this planet today. 2.7 billion people claim this. There are places all over this planet today where Jesus has his reign and his rule in people's lives and in places. But what we learn from the scriptures is that someday Jesus will have his reign and rule over every person in everything. And so it's a, it's, it, it, and so what Jesus is, is announcing here is that the kingdom is arriving. It's arriving. And the king, like Jesus is establishing his reign and rule in people's hearts and lives. You know, one by one by one. Like, literally, like, think about the initial day for some of these initial, like, early Christians. That Peter got up, and he's talking about Jesus. And he talked about the message. And 3,000 people were like, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. And boom, in an instant, like, the reign and rule of Jesus was arriving in people's hearts and lives. And starting to take shape in the world and the planet that we live in. Um, so that God's kingdom, it is arriving. But he also says, um, well, actually, no, I want to mention this, too real quick, um, because Jesus then, he, he goes around for the next three years in his ministry, like this is game day, game day, this is the beginning, he goes around for the next three years, and he keeps explaining what the kingdom is like, what the kingdom of God is like, I put a few of them in your note sheet there, just a few of the ones that are in the book of Mark, there's actually a lot more in the book of Matthew, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Bible, uh, but I put a few from the book of Mark, and it's where Jesus would be teaching, and he, he'd have a group of people around who would say, hey guys, the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a mustard seed. The, 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 though it's the smallest seed, 
that, that, that you, you can find. And then when it starts to grow, it just kind of takes over everything. And, and, and all the birds can, can find a place that, and, and, and Jesus is explaining, he's, he says the kingdom of God um, is like this. And you can, you can check those out on Matthew, on Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 10 is where a few of those are like. And I would love for you to just check those out on your own time and, uh, and explore those. And explore the teachings of Jesus where he talks about the kingdom, what the kingdom is like. But one of the first things we realize is that Jesus says the kingdom is coming to you. But he also says this, repent and believe. Because the kingdom is drawing you. And, and we've talked about these two specific things a little bit. We've talked about repent a lot here. Repent is like, I don't know, it's kind of this really churchy word. <laughs> and, and, and what, what but we, we talked about this even last week. All repent really means is what's on many of your guys' shirts. 180. 180. And, and, and repent, what, what repent actually means is I was going this way, and now I'm repenting and turning towards Jesus and the things that he has for me. But I love that, that the writer, that Mark, in this specific case, he, he doesn't talk about repenting without talking about believing. Okay? Because uh, uh, what he's trying to seal in our minds is that these two things go together. The, you know, I was thinking about it this week, okay? And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it was last Sunday night, and I was like, can you guys give me a cast? And they're like, why would you want a cast? It's so good you don't have to have a cast. We don't cast toes and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, you don't live with a six, four, and two-year-old. Okay? I'm not worried about me. I'm not worried about that. I am worried about my daughter stepping on my foot. It only happened once this week, and I was only a little bit mad. That's not true. I was actually really mad. But here's the thing. Because I believed that it would hurt very badly <laughs> if someone stepped on my toe. It caused me to do something. <laughs> it caused me to protect it. It caused me to think differently. It caused me to like, you know, do this thing a lot. And sit, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then, no, no, actually one of my girls actually swiped it with her hand. And I was like, what are you doing? Those are the people stuck in the middle of the room. And I'm like, well, I kept it off the floor so they wouldn't be stepped on. I was trying to protect it. My point, is, my point is that because I believed that it would hurt, I knew it would hurt, I, it, it, it reinforced my actions. And I think the writer, Mark, is, is, is etching these two things in our mind that with a 180, with repentance, comes belief. A belief that, that calls us into action. And I, I wrote it this way a, a couple times, but um, I mean... If you believe in something, it calls you to action. Whether that be a product or cause, a business, an ideology, a service, belief brings action. And in that day, Mark and Jesus alone, Mark and Jesus alone, was trying to get the people to repent from believing that some kind of social agenda or some kind of political agenda was going to save them. And he was trying to get them to turn like, no, the living God has come down as a human being, died, was buried, and rose from the dead again, and turn from all these other things that you trust in, turn from all these other things that you believe in, repent, and turn towards that good news. And Mark's trying to edge that back in, which kind of brings me to the second thing that I want to talk about this morning from that. And this one, this one I'm, I'm excited about. The kingdom of God has no dual citizens. The kingdom of God has no dual citizens. Um, I was thinking about some of this uh, this week. Can we wait for the F-18s? <laughs> I was thinking about some of that this week. And I was thinking about my, my middle daughter. And my middle daughter... Uh, Jenny, she's our four-year-old, and our first daughter was born in New Zealand, but we were on a work visa at the time, so she was just what we were. She got her, the same work visa with a lot of money, chilled out, and a little work visa stamped her, her U.S. passport. But my second daughter, Jenny, was born um, while we were on a resident visa. And, and since we were on a resident visa, she immediately, out of the womb, 
was granted dual citizenship, my four-year-old. And I remember it was, I don't know, we didn't think about passports or the whole thing. And, um, but then we had a quick trip coming up. We needed to come back to the States for something, I can't remember. And we had a trip, quick trip coming up, and we found out we could get a New Zealand passport in 10 days. And so we just put in for the New Zealand passport, so here it is. Got a, got a nice little black passport with a silver fern leaf right here. And this is my, um, my daughter, Jenny's passport, she's the only one with one of these. Um, this is her US passport as well, she's got two of them. And um, we just, you know, I don't know like to pay a lot of money for books. <laughs> um, but she's got, she's got two of them. And uh, I tell you this, this to, to tell you this, okay? And I shared the, the full long story with some of you guys, and you'll get the full long story again at some point in life, but um, we were moving from New Zealand a, a little over three years ago now. We were moving from New Zealand, and, um, and we were gonna stop in Australia on the way back and just take a week before we, you know, decompress before we hit the ground running back here in the States um, for work. And so we're taking a week and it was the third morning and I grabbed my surfboard and I was going to go out and grab a surf that morning and, and, uh, and Kelsey was like, hey, before you go, will you check on Jenny? And so I was like, okay, I'm going to check on Jenny. So I went and looked at her little crib and she was only eight months old at the time or around eight months. And so I checked the crib and there is baby vomit. And we've had issues with Jenny in the past uh, with her bowels, and we knew that this wasn't like normal, it wasn't good, that we needed to get in right away. We sold all of our technology, all the phones, everything. And so I remember picking up the little room thing, and I was like, I gotta find a cab. And I called the cab, and the cab comes, and I'm like, just close to this hospital. And he takes us to this like backwoods, rural, nowheresville, Australian outback hospital, where we've gotta now wait for the radiologist to come in. And it's like 5.30 a.m., and I'm like, what does he get in with? He gets in at 8.30, and I'm like, oh, twiddle our thumbs for a while. And the radiologist comes in and he takes one look at her belly and he's like, oh, I know what it is, not that big a deal, but we need to have some child surgeons on hand, so we're going to actually need to call an ambulance and, and send you an hour and a half down to the nearest city, which is Brisbane, Australia. And so they started to order all those things and wait for the ambulance. And I remember they were like, okay, um, we need to get Laura. I don't know if her name is Laura. We're just going to call her Laura right now. <laughs> and Laura from Revenue is going to come have a conversation with you. Um, about payment. And uh, I remember uh, I just looked at Kelsey and I said, honey, um, I don't know if it's going to matter, but when Laura from Revenue comes in, get out the New Zealand passport. <laughs> and so Laura comes in and she's like all trepid and she's like, so I heard you guys are Americans. <laughs> Um, just wanted to talk through some pricing with you for a minute. And uh, can I see a passport real quick? Kelsey's like, here you go. She's like, oh, thank God. Oh, wow. Oh, and she's like relieved, like this breath of fresh, like she's just like, woo, you guys are good. Okay. And then she walks out. She's like, okay, it's taken care of. And I was like, oh. She's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we cover New Zealand citizens in an emergency situation and, and vice versa. And we're like, no way. We never saw another lady from nothing. Ever again. I tell you that story to tell you this. I'm trying to make a point here. I think that many of us in our faith and in our kingdom citizenship try to play the dual passport card a little bit. Where we, you know, Sunday morning, this pass this passport works. I'm gonna get out this passport, I'm gonna come in and and do the Jesus thing, and you know, ride the Jesus train, and, and live for the kingdom of God, and live as a, a citizen of the kingdom of God. But then all of a sudden, you know, 8 a.m. on Monday morning comes, and it's like, I'm, I'll go back to the citizenship for a second. And I think you get the point that I'm trying to make here. And the point that Jesus is trying to make, and the point that Mark is trying to make in this passage is that with the kingdom of God, when there is a belief, when there's a belief that causes a 180 and causes a turn, it doesn't mean that you get to live as a dual citizen anymore. It means that we trade one in and we live for the citizenship of the kingdom of God. I hope that makes sense. Um, I, I, so so re repenting, it, it literally is a turning away from one kingdom and a turn towards becoming a citizen 
of the kingdom of God. And the thing that I want to spend the remaining time of our, remaining bit of our time talking about is how living as a citizen of the kingdom comes with a call. It comes with a call. And, um, and that's kind of our, our, our last break, kind of, or not our last break, but our next break. <laughs> We've said every single week, we're building this church on some foundations. And the first, the cornerstone, the first brick is that we're building this church on the fact that Jesus is greater. And then last week we, we said we're building this church on, this isn't the cornerstone, we're building this church on the fact that we are becoming people. We're not escaping, but we're with Jesus, like allowing him to help us become something different. And, and today that, that brick is calling. And that we're building this church on the fact that Living as a citizen of the kingdom of God comes with a kingdom calling. And so I want to talk about that for a minute, but let's finish the, the text this morning as we do that. So verse 16, it says this, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. That's crazy, right? I mean, we read that, it's just like crazy because, you know, we, well, I think there's a bunch of things going on in my mind. I think about the fact that, um, I, I, did, I don't know, anybody ever grew up going to like old school, Sunday school? Um, but I did. I was. I went to old school Sunday school where they put a few of us boys in a class, and um, probably a couple of girls. I wasn't into girls at the time, so. Um, not that. Anyway. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is this. I just remember like the flannel graph was up there, and um, and, and there was always that super white Jesus, right? <laughs> Like and he was like super, he was like super white and he had like the white like gown and the blue sash and he's always like super skinny and um, and then you know and then it's like and then here's the fishermen and they're like these big burly like bearded guys and, and, and you know and like it's almost like you need to make a voice for Jesus I don't know if you've seen those vintage twenty one videos um, you can YouTube that later but it's like oh, Jesus is just like come on guys come on. and and and. Y'all, the point that I'm trying to make is this. Is Jesus was a carpenter. Okay? And, and the thing about carpentry in Jesus' in Nazareth, where you know his hometown, is that there wasn't a lot of wood around. So he might have fashioned some things with wood, and he might have like, you know, done some things, and I've worked with wood a little bit and he, he built houses and, and the whole thing. But but there's a lot more stone around there than wood. And so there's a good chance that Jesus was a chiseler, <laughs> and that Jesus made things out of stone. And I, I mean, I've done concrete construction for a few summers, and I'll tell you what, like, concrete construction does not leave you wimpy with, like, frail, like, manicured, lotiony hands. It, does, it just doesn't do that. And, and so there's that thought in my mind, sorry, I diverged, that's going on with that. But then there's also the reality that this is a small town. I'm from a small town. This is a small town. It's a rural town. And you've got two family businesses offering. You've got, you got fishermen who fish for a living, and you've got carpentry and someone who makes things for a living. Small town. What's going on? Okay? And, and so, like, the, the, the reality is that these guys would have entered these professions because these, these professions would have been happening for centuries. And it's like, well, my granddaddy, my grand. Dad, daddy, or whatever. And, and, like, and like everybody's done this for years. And, and in hard times, we just work a little bit harder. And, and, and in good times, I guess we could take our foot off the gas. But these are family businesses that are happening, is what I'm trying to point out. And so there's a good chance. There's a good chance. I'm not saying it happened. But there's a good chance that these fishermen went to Jesus and his family for chiseled goods. And that Jesus and his family went to these guys for dinner. And that they knew each other. 
And that they had a little bit of life experience. And that as John sort of prepared the way in these first few verses, that whenever Jesus finally steps out on the scene and whenever Jesus finally gives them the call, that it's like, oh yeah, I'm with him. Yeah, sorry, Dad. See ya. And, and, and they take off. And they go towards this kingdom call. Um, and, and I think about that. And this is our third, third point if you're following along and you're taking notes. And this is where we have that brick um, this morning. And it's the idea of turning towards a kingdom calling over a wanderer. Turning towards a kingdom calling over wandering. And, and what we see from, from this, this text and what we see from this is that Jesus came along and he said, come on guys, follow me. We got a job, we got a mission, it's game day, this is the inauguration, we're beginning the ministry, we're starting, we're going. And, um, and Jesus calls them to that. And I think that for us, when I look at the word calling, when I look at the word wandering, uh, for so many Christians, for so many people who put their faith and, and trust in Jesus, um, calling is, is one of those things where, uh, I don't know, but you're like me, and you're like, man, I wish I could have just been like a fisherman, and, and Jesus said, hey, come follow me, and I'm like, Okay, I literally know what to do. <laughs> Put one foot for the other and follow that guy. The human being. The, you know, Jesus who's, who's going throughout. And, and then we get to like the, you know, the, the, this day and age where we're like, man, what does calling even look like? And, like, and I wrote down a few things. Because it's, uh, I think, you know, many Jesus followers would stress about what is God specifically calling me to do? I mean, do I work this job or do I work that one? Do I live in this town or do I live in that one? Do I live in this town or community or do I live in that one? Do I do I do I do I go to do I give my kids these opportunities? Have them go to this school? Do do, do these things or do I do those things? And, and um, even to the point where we're like, man, do I go to this church or do I go to that church? Do I be a part of this group or do I be a part of that group? I mean, which friends should I have? We got 24 hours. And then the reality is that calling can be something for you, and calling can be something for me that's a bit paralyzing. So, like, I wish I just had a physical Jesus to follow in that. But then when it comes to wandering, I think we get that, right? We understand wandering. Like, calling is like one of those things that kind of starts to sound like, what do I do? But wandering is something that we're all like, yeah, no, I do that. <laughs> and, uh, and I wrote it this way. We have a couple slides. But wandering is what we do as a result of not knowing we're living our calling. When we don't know what to do, we wonder. Uh, but wandering is also, I believe, the result of trying to pick up both passports. And living with one passport on a Sunday and one passport on a Monday. One passport on a Wednesday and one passport on a Friday. And I think wandering is the result of trying to live as a dual citizen. Um, so the question this morning that I have for us that we're kind of just narrowing into is how do we turn towards calling over one day? How do we turn towards the calling from the King Jesus over with our lives wandering? And, um, and it's not going to be on the screen, but I want to kind of let you guys in on something um, that uh, I just, it's so foundational to our church and what's going to be coming over the next few weeks and months in years. Because Mark chapter 1, verse 17, um, in the English Standard Version, okay, not the, the NI, that we read out of the NIV, which is this new international version of the Bible. And as many of you guys know, the Bible is like, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And as I start to learn Spanish, um, or at least attempt to try, um, with my, I, I keep saying I've got, I've got to learn because my girls are going to have conversations without me. And exclude me from that. So um, I'm working on learning, and the thing that I keep understanding as I as I as I grapple with the language is, it's hard to convey something sometimes. And because uh, in one language it's hard to bring it over, but the more literal translation, which is the ESV, which we don't read out of because it's a little clunky and like hard to navigate, um, it says this. It says, I have it right here. And Jesus said to them, "Follow me, and I will make you become." Fishers of men. So, so follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And for us in this church, that verse alone is going to be a verse that shapes us. 
that it, it's shaped me over the last decade as I've kind of learned from a, 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 another, another church and another pastor, um, a guy named Jim Koopman, who originated this concept of, of discipleship and, and following and developing as a Jesus follower. And it's kind of a three parts in that verse. It's the idea of, okay, I've done the 180, I've come and followed Jesus by doing the 180, and then as I follow him, he's making me into something different. I'm becoming, like we talked about last week. That, 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 um, that okay, I made the 180, and now he's causing me to become something different. And, and a lot, here's the deal, a lot of, I, I just gotta be real with you real quick. A lot of people end right there. They end right there. They, they, they hear the call, and, and okay, okay, I'm going to turn, and I'm going to follow you, Jesus, and I'm going to have you get me into a small group. If we're going to have small groups in this church eventually, <laughs> get in there. Um, Jesus, I'm going to have you get me on a service team. I'm going to have you change a few things that I do on Monday morning. I'm going to have you do these things and this work in my life. But oftentimes, uh, uh, for the life of, of, of Jesus followers, we, we turn and we become something a little bit different. But we stop short of the kingdom calling that I think he's put on each and every single one of our lives, which is the last thing where he says, I'll, I'll make you become fishers of men. And literally, that's all that means And we say it around here, we're going to do a core value series coming up after this one, is we be people who inspire hope in others through Jesus. And so we have this idea of come and follow, which is like a head level change, and I'll make you become, which is like a heart level change. But the mission and the calling of the kingdom calling is that, we, that, that it actually affects the things that we do. And then it's a hand level change, where we begin to live our lives intentionally and different as, as citizens of the kingdom of God. And so um, I'm going to actually ask I, a couple more things to say. I'll, I'll have the band go ahead and come on up here um, right now. But I wanted to show you this slide real quick because I think that sometimes we, we, we think calling is so crazy. And I want to make it as simple as possible. And I want you to, if you're a drawer or a diagram person, or like I'm trying to leave a little note, a little, little blank space in your note sheet, we have this diagram right up here. And I think your calling is super simple. I think your calling is where your passions, your abilities, and your sustenance intersect with God's purposes for your life. God's purposes is that you would become intentional. God's purposes is that you would, he would, he would, you would follow him, you would make him become something different, and that, that, that something different that you would become is someone who inspires hope and helps other people turn towards him and Jesus. And so that's his purposes, that's his mission, that's what he's after. And that wherever our passions, wherever our abilities, wherever our, I don't think it's like we make it so complicated, like which job should I work, which town should I live, which, which, you know, which, which path should I take, which group should I be, which church should I be. We, we make it so complicated, we get paralyzed, and I think it's as simple as wherever our passions, wherever our abilities, and however we can sustain ourselves and put food on the table and roof over our head, however we can get that done, mixed with God's purposes, is our calling. And it is our kingdom calling. And we make it so hard sometimes. But I think it's that simple. I want to say a couple more things real quick. And we have a couple more slides. And this just hit me right between the eyes this week. Because see, I think we get wandering and we find calling to be hard. And the, the, the reality is that wandering seeks joy and things that bring temporary happiness. Calling finds joy in Jesus. See, wandering, wandering, wandering seeks joy in anything that's going to bring a moment of relief. Wandering seeks joy in anything that we think is going to look good for a, a moment. Wandering seeks joy in instant gratification. But, but, but calling finds joy in a risen Savior. And finds joy in Jesus. Uh, uh, wandering Seek success in today's accomplishments. Calling finds success in Jesus' accomplishments. You see, it's been said before that every other, every other single like world religion, everything, every other thing that you put your faith in is based on what you can do to earn your way to God. But Christianity is what Jesus has done to, to buy you back and, and to, to give you a chance. 
One calling finds success in his accomplishments. This one, this one just gets me. Wandering seeks meaning in a personal image. Right? We're going to over Insta like my wife has been showing me this Instagram account this week that is cracking me up but showing the sad reality and state of the world we live in. And she's showing me like this, I don't know, in Instagram influencers, like fails or something like that. And people just doing the stupidest things to convey an image. And the account shows where things go wrong. But I think, man, how indicative of that is, is that of not only our culture, but what's inside of our hearts is we try to portray an image to the world around us. And I think that wandering will, will, will continue to make us chase after this perfect image that we can portray to the world around us. But calling, what calling does is it finds, it finds meaning in being conformed to his image. And to looking not like, literally, physically like Jesus, but, but, but learning to love the way that he loves. Learning to treat people the way that he treats people. Learning to... To, to hate the things that he hates and being conformed to his image. Wandering seeks fulfillment and experiences. Um, we live in the, the age, like with Instagram and everything about image, we live in the age of experiences. I, I read an article recently about how many people try to climb Mount Everest if there was a traffic jam in 2019 and so many people died that Mount Everest is becoming this routine experience because people are craving experiences for fulfillment. I'm one of, I, I, Put me in love, climb Mount Everest, and it sounds like a blast. But wandering seeks fulfillment in those experiences. We're calling finds fulfillment in living on mission, in his purposes, living out a kingdom call. That's where calling finds fulfillment. And then the last one I'll say, and I'm going to leave you with this, is wandering seeks hope in places that it doesn't call home. Wandering seeks hope in places it doesn't call home. Because hope, we say turn toward hope around here. Hope lives in a kingdom call. You will never, like, like, mark my words, you will never find more hope than when you're living on mission with Jesus. You will never find more hope than when you are living out your call in life. Because it supersedes everything else that could damage or destroy your hope. It's just like the ultimate... So I'm going to pray for us, and uh, um, as I pray for us this morning, we're also going to prepare for communion. And, uh, and basically, in the back here, uh, we've got some juice and some bread, and the juice is symbolic of the blood of Jesus that was poured out, and the bread is symbolic of the body of Jesus that was broken, so that we could be citizens of the kingdom, so that we could have a call. So that we can go into our Monday mornings, 8 a.m. tomorrow, so we can go into our jobs and we can know that we live with a purpose and that we have a calling and that we are a citizen of one kingdom, his kingdom. And so this morning, um, I just want to invite you to take that communion. I want to invite you to celebrate with us. If you're unsure about the whole thing, that's cool. You can leave it um, and, and stay seated. But as we kind of go into this last song this morning and uh, kind of close off this service, I want us to celebrate in this time communion together. So Jesus, thank you for today. Um, I pray, God, that uh, that you help this to be a celebratory time, that, that we, um, God, that we can find purpose, and fulfillment, and meaning in the calling that you've given us, God. Um, I pray that in this time of communion, that we can just celebrate the, the death and burial of God and the resurrection. That we can have this life, so we can have this home, so we can have this hope. So your name and pleasure.
baptism, 10 minutes out back, info center in the back. We'll see you guys next week.